Hello and welcome to Bowtie Certified. Uh, Happy New Year to everyone. <laughs> this is episode 13 and um, here on Bowtie Certified, we follow the journey of others through certifications and learning and how it's given these uh, great people uh, extreme benefits to their lives. And so um, my name is Anthony Tzavellas. I am a technical instructor and course creator in Google Cloud. And if you are looking to, uh, to either get trained or certified, uh, you can hit me up on the, uh, the link down below, or you can simply message me on uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, pick your choice. <laughs> so anyways, today I have a special guest, uh, Christoph Limpelaer. Hey, Anthony, thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I, I love how you can pop up those banners at the bottom, by the way. I'm going to have to ask you about this, this platform you're using because when I do podcasts like that, I always need to be able to do that, but I have to do yeah. it in post, which is a pain. So I'm, I'm really, yeah, this is awesome. It's like the floating banner beneath me. It's great. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's built into the software, which is really cool. Nice. Um, so uh, just a little backstory. Uh, Christoph and I had met um, back when I was working with a consulting firm and, uh, he was at Linux Academy and, um, and we had met, uh, more of, more of a, on a business level. Uh, but eventually we became friends and we kept in touch and, uh, and yeah, I was, um, listening to his story on, uh, on his new discord. And I was like, I need Christoph on the show <laughs> to tell his story, uh, which is a fantastic story. I'm not going to give anything away. Um, I, I do want Christoph to tell it as raw and um, <laughs> in, in all of its rawness as it is. So, so diving right in, uh, Christoph, what were you doing before diving into tech? And um, what made you decide that this was your path? That's a really big question. So I may go on, on a lot of tangents in, in answering it, but All in, good. <laughs> we got, I, we got time. As, as some people might have guessed, although I say that a lot of people get it wrong, actually, when they see the name Christoph and Limpelaer, they, uh, they typically think it's from Europe or Canada, and it is from Europe. It's from France, not Germany or anywhere else, as some, most people think it is. Uh, but I was born and raised in France, and my, my wow. dad was French. My mom's American. She moved to France. They met, they got married, and, and they had me and my brother in France. And so I lived there for about 11 years before we moved to the United States. And when I, when I moved to the United States, I had exactly zero friends. I didn't know <laughs> anyone in the States at all. Uh, we moved to a, a state, South Carolina, a, a city called Greenville. And uh, so because I had no friends whatsoever, I turned to computers. I think a lot of people kind of fall in that trap as well. Yeah. At first, it was really focusing on gaming. And at the time, I was playing a game called StarCraft 1. If there's any StarCraft fans out there, please hit me up. I'd love to Woo! play some time. Although I try to stay off of it because it's extremely addictive. But uh, it's <laughs> such a great game. And so I played a lot of StarCraft 1. But the, the thing with StarCraft is, at least on the, the online side, they had all these gaming channels and they had clans, gaming clans. And so I joined some of those gaming clans and kind of fell into a trap of these what they call the warring clans and they they were meant to be warring within the game right you're supposed to go head to head in a game of starcraft one see who wins and then the winner is the best one but they kind of evolved beyond that and the reason they evolved beyond that is because those games had these chat channels that were designed a certain way and you could create bots and the bots would connect to the game right. and then you could chat chat via the bots except of course people got creative and they took it much further than that so they started to, to build these distributed networks of bots and they would attack each other. So like wow. say you had a, a channel that you could have 50 people in, I think it was less than that, but let's say 50 people in, mm -hmm. you would you would load up thousands or tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of bots and you would flood those channels with just spam messages and, and stuff like that. And so really fell down that rabbit hole. Um, clans would fight back and forth. They would deface each other's websites and stuff like that. And and I really loved it. It was, it, it's crazy to, to think back and, and think about it today, but that's, that's kind of how I fell into tech and development because 
I was like, wow, how are the how are these guys building these bots? How does the bot work? How do you develop that? How do you code that? How do you put it out into production and, and actually use it as a real bot? And so I started to develop bots and and do things like that. And, and that's kind of kind of how I fell into information technology without even realizing it was called information <laughs> technology or that nice. it was an entire industry that you could have a, a career built out of. That's so started out cool. gaming, which is weird. Amazing. So um, your security background actually came from gaming. And I had, again, I had no idea that it was called cybersecurity, but yeah, exactly. It was like, okay, somebody just completely defaced our website. First yeah. of all, how'd they do it? Second of all, how could we fix it and prevent it from happening again? And then, of course, we had some guys that would go on the offense and do the same thing to them. And I mean, you're talking about I was 12, 13 at the time. So you're mm -hmm. talking about teenagers. Uh, nothing super serious came of it. There were a couple of times where maybe somebody found out where I lived and my real name and stuff like that. And and that was kind of scary. But um, it also taught me that privacy can be really important and you have to yeah. be careful with with what you put out online and, and stuff like that. But look at me. I mean, I'm, I put all kinds of inf information online anyway. It's just how do you protect yourself and and, and your assets yeah. in, in that way? Yeah. Well, sure. I mean, that's that's like the ongoing thing, right? Uh, you know, we give our information to all these big companies like Google and Facebook and Instagram. And, you know, a lot of us don't even think about what we're giving away until we really know what's been given away. And then we're like, Hey, wait a second. <laughs> it's, it's pretty scary. Once you, once you really look at it or into it, especially if you, you know, going back to, to when I was younger, if, if you've got somebody that message you messages you out of the blue and that sends you a picture of your girlfriend and, and knows the name of your girlfriend and you have no idea who they are. And yeah, you kind of take a look back and you're like, Whoa, this is really creepy. <laughs> I need to be careful here. Right. But it, but yeah. it teaches you. Yeah. So, um, Christoph, tell us a little bit more about your backstory. Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, um, you know, starting with, with getting into gaming and getting into it through gaming, mm -hmm. I, I think I learned a couple of things from, from that experience. And one of those things was that number one, I really, really enjoy it. You know, I, I got into building gaming computers, even though I didn't have a whole lot of money, I had to find parts and make them work somehow and modify the cases and really enjoyed that side of it as well. So I dabbled into that a little bit, but then, you know, going back to, to building and defending websites, I yeah. figured out that I really enjoyed building applications. And so I kind of started going down that path a little bit more, but also to be honest with you on the, the cybersecurity side of what I was doing, mm -hmm. I was turned off by that quite a bit because a lot of people that were in that area or in that field weren't the most welcoming and they definitely were not the most helpful. And so a lot of times I would hit a wall and keep in mind, again, I'm 13, 14, so I, I'm still learning a lot of stuff and, and I right. definitely have the grit to keep pursuing. I'd reach out to some friends and say, hey, I'm trying to do this, but it's not working. How do I get past that? And usually they just respond, respond with, well, if you're good enough, you'll figure it out. And so that's the kind of response that I kept getting over and over wow. again. And as a 13 year old with no mentorship and, and nobody to guide you, I just kind of gave up and mm. it really turned me away from cybersecurity or what's called cybersecurity now. And so I just kind of gravitated a little bit more towards development because people there seemed a little bit friendlier as weird as that sounds. Right. And so, um, kind of fell down that, that rabbit hole still in my early teens figured out, I definitely want to do something in IT. I just don't know what it was or what it is. And so I went through high school, graduated from high school, went to college and in college, just spent some time trying to figure out who I was and what I really truly wanted to, to end up doing. Right. The problem is though, I think it's still the case today, but back when I was in school, which wasn't that long ago, you really still didn't have a lot of that guidance. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of, of the issues that I had when I was younger were surfacing again at the college level, guidance counselors just weren't helpful at all for me. The ones I had truly didn't understand the IT industry at all. And so when you'd ask them like, hey, I, I love doing this. What kinds of jobs can I get doing that? And they would list these jobs that just sounded so boring and horrible. And like, nah, that's not <laughs> what I want to do. <laughs> and so, you know, I'm going through school and I'm like, I don't know what to do. Nobody seems to know what I want to do. I'm just going to try to figure it out. And um at the time, I was listening to a lot of different podcasts. One of those podcasts that I, I still listen to this day is called Mixergy, which is all about business. 
And I, I was learning so much about business from listening to these podcasts on the way to class that it, it was really inspiring, except once I got to class and sat in class, then I felt like I was wasting time. And I was learning more from those podcast episodes. And I'm like, this makes no sense, paying thousands of dollars to get into class, feel like I'm not really learning much, feel like I'm learning more from a free podcast, what's going on, right? So what, what were you studying in class? So I started out with computer engineering and then realized that I didn't really like that. I didn't like the physical aspect as much. So I moved to something called computer information systems, which is very similar mm -hmm. to computer science, just less theory, more practical. Got it. So we were learning stuff like Java, SQL, um, sub theory, just things like that, that I, I wasn't, I, I knew I didn't want to program in Java when I got out of college, but that's really all we were learning. Right. Um, so I still, you know, don't get me wrong. I still learned some valuable skills, mm -hmm. but I felt like I was learning a whole lot more outside of the classroom with things that I was doing on my own, including podcasts. And so it, it kind of brought up that question of, okay, if, if I don't want to be programming Java for a bank when I'm out of college, what am I going to do? How am I going to figure this out? And as I was listening to, to this podcast, I also found this book called Scaling PHP Applications by a guy named Steve, Steve Corona. And when I was reading that book, it's like, okay, well, he, he, he was one of the co-founders of a company called TwitPick, which did images for Twitter before Twitter had images. Right. And Twitter ended up having images. So I think they, they kind of folded after that, unfortunately. But it's like he was talking about scaling the application, getting so much load that it, it would break the apps. He'd have to wake up in the middle of the night, fix it. And he had to learn how to do that on the go. And he kind of shared that throughout his book. And I was reading that. I couldn't put the book down. It was just so fascinating. I was learning so much from that. And I'm like, this is what I want to learn. This is what I want to do. I want to work at a company like Twipic. I want to solve these incredibly hard problems. I, I want to be in the heat and the battle of it. You know, how do I talk to Steve? I, I need to talk to this guy. I need to talk to these other guys that are writing these other books that are fascinating. But why would they ever talk to me? I'm just a kid in college. I have nothing to offer them. And then that's when it clicked. I'm like, oh, podcasting. That, that's how you get to these people. And so I, uh, I launched a podcast called Scale Your Code. And I invited Steve and he said, sure, I'll hop on your, I'll hop on your podcast and, and Amazing. Steve hopped on the podcast. And, and I learned so much from that. And I developed so many different relationships that uh, it kind of opened a lot of different doors that I didn't even know existed and that I don't think anybody else knew existed. It's just those hidden doors that you, you can't really um, find through traditional means, but that the podcast right. was able to, to open. And that kind of really changed my perspective in a lot of different ways. Amazing. Amazing. Um, so now I, I know that, um, I, I put out a, a post, uh, in on social media with regards to scale your code. Um, that was then acquired two years later, correct? Yes. So I founded it in 2015, January, 2015. And how old and, are you then? Uh, 2015. I, I'm so bad at math. Let's see. Five. <laughs> You're in your uh, early 20s. Yeah, early 20s. Let's say 20, 20, 21, something like that. Okay. Okay. And uh, and so it was acquired by Linux Academy. Yes. And uh, and then where do, where did you go from there? So it, it kind of overlaps a little bit. Uh, so I'll just briefly provide some some context around that and, and the acquisition. But so I, I started Scully Code because I was trying to solve that problem that I was just describing, right? Getting okay. some of that knowledge and, and trying to learn more. Of, of the uh, the hot skills in tech. And so it started out as a podcast and I started getting sponsorships for the podcast. So I would go to companies and say, hey, I have X amount of downloads per episode. Would you like to sponsor your product on the podcast? I'll charge this amount, so on and so forth. Started getting some really good sponsors on there. And then I realized, oh, well, this is cool. You know, I can take some of what I'm learning from the episodes and I can turn it into training material. So I started doing some training material around stuff like Redis, Laravel, which is a, a PHP framework and, mm -hmm. and things that were really popular at the time. And I put all of that for free on, on YouTube, started getting a lot of different views and subscribers on there, on there, which again, provided more sponsorship uh, potential and experiences. And so I, um, I somehow came across Linux Academy. I don't remember how, but I reached out to them and I was like, Hey guys, our interests align very well. My audience would be very interested in, in what you have to offer, which is training material for Linux and cloud. Would you like to sponsor my show? And 
first I didn't hear back, followed up a couple of times. And eventually I got a response back saying, yeah, our, our CEO and founder, Anthony James, would like to talk to you about a sponsorship when you have availability. So we hopped on a call and I talked to, to Anthony for quite a while. I, I don't remember how long it was, but we it felt like we were on there for a bit. And he, he started out asking me like, hey, what are you really trying to do with Scalar Code? Who are you? What's your background? And what are your interests and things like that? And by the end of that phone call, I had a, um, I had a, a job offer. And um, wow. so at the time, it wasn't like, hey, I want to buy Scalar Code from you. It was just like, hey, we, we want you to join the team and we want you to create AWS training material for us based on your background. Would you be interested in doing that? And we went back and forth for a couple of months. I was really interested in growing Scalar Code. So at first, my inclination was to say no. But the mm -hmm. more we talked, the more I realized that we had a lot of values and our missions were very well aligned. Synergies. Synergies. And they were well ahead of where I was. And so I felt mm -hmm. like, you know what, this could be a really good way to take what I'm trying to do with Scalar Code at a much bigger scale. And so nice. I joined Linux Academy as an employee. I still did Scalar Code on the side for a bit. And then about a year after I joined is when we officially acquired and merged Scalar Code into Linux Academy officially. Nice. Very nice. And a non traditional uh, way of getting a job, I guess. You could <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> and to get acquired at the same time. <laughs> um, so, so I guess that was your, um, your entry into, uh, I guess you could say the world of it as an employee. It was my first salary job, right? I, I had other, cause there was a, another startup I didn't even mention called college vibe that I did for about a year. So I had a lot of tech and, and actual work experience, right? but more so as a self-employed person or consultant. So my first actual salaried employee job, like you said, was Linux Academy. Yeah. Wow. It was very weird to actually get a, a, a solid salary and, and paycheck. I'd never experienced that before. So it was very strange. So, so what was going through your mind when you, uh, when you were, um, you were looking at being acquired? I mean, it's, it's, I can't even imagine me being 20 years old and, uh, and, and getting, um, a, a big company to say, Hey, we want to buy your stuff. <laughs> yeah. When you put it that way, it is, it is interesting, but I, I guess I wasn't really thinking about it that way. It was more so of, it's kind of sad to say that, but because I had the full-time job and I was trying to do Scully code on the side, it was a no brainer. I was burning out. I didn't have the time. I was doing it on nights and weekends. My wife, actually girlfriend at the time, uh, obviously was not getting any attention from me and it, it just wasn't sustainable. I didn't want to keep going that way. And yeah. so when, uh, when Anthony was like, Hey, I really think we have a great opportunity to, to merge SYC or Scully code into this. It just, it yeah. made sense but it was still sad at the same time. Like it's bittersweet, right? Yes. I've got yeah. an acquisition. I'm like 25 or something like that. This is crazy. Absolutely nuts. But at the same time, it, it just, it felt like the right thing. And it felt right. like I was giving up my baby, but I was giving my baby more resources, which was right. also fantastic. So it's, it was bittersweet, I guess is, is the way that I would, I would describe it. And, uh, and so when, after you had, uh, join Linux Academy. It was uh, Linux Academy was acquired by a cloud guru uh, a few years later. Yes. So I joined Linux Academy in 2016 as employee number seven. We were just starting to grow a little wow. bit more. Uh, we had about $4 million in annual revenue at that time, which is it's still a very sizable amount for a startup. A lot of startups don't even get to that point. So it was, it was very yeah. commendable. And then four years later, we grew that to 40 million in annual revenue and 200 employees. So grew quite significantly in both revenue, but also an employee count, which of course brought a lot of its challenges. And then in 2019, at the end of 2019, so I thought we were still in 2020 for a second. I was going to say a year ago, <laughs> but uh, a little bit over a year ago, we're in 2021 yes. now, uh, we were uh, acquired, both LA and ACG were acquired by Bain Capital and merged into one organization under the name of ACG. And so that overnight doubled revenue and doubled employee count. We were now at 400 plus employees. And then a few months later, we were at 100 million revenue. And that's about the time that I, I uh, decided to, to leave. Wow. So you, you basically just left. You're like, I'm done. <laughs> yeah, I mean... Four, four years doesn't sound like a long time, but when you're when you're growing at breakneck speed, 
you have a tremendous amount of ups and downs and the ups are very high, right? The, the highs are very high. The lows are very, very low. So it's, it's a huge emotional roller coaster. And it, it just felt like I needed to step, to step back, take a break a little bit, celebrate, look back on what I've accomplished, what we've accomplished and, and kind of think through that and spend time with the family. And so, yeah, I took about one or two months off, just spent some time with the wife, with my dog biscuit, fix stuff around the house that was long overdue right so the honey do list and yeah. um and then after that i was like okay I'm, I'm good i'm ready to go again let's do this nice nice and uh and so when you when you left uh linux academy and um and you you know spent that time with yourself you then uh started up cyber tell us more about that i, I think it it's a really good way to tie it all back together to what I was talking about in the beginning as well, because wh when I left and, and I'd been thinking about it for a while as well, right it, towards the end of, of my tenure at Linux Academy, I was like, well, so what's, what's next after Linux Academy? Mm -hmm. um, because we're, we're growing really fast. I'm not necessarily a big company kind of guy. I prefer smaller companies for the most part. I just really enjoy the startup feel and vibe. So what am I going to do? And, you know, how long am I going to stay here? And then what, what's next? And so when I when I officially left and took some time off and really self-reflected, I kept thinking back to, OK, I'm really, really passionate about education because I had a, a horrible education experience. I really did not like school whatsoever. I felt like it was not right. made for me in any way. How do I help solve that? How do I make it better for future generations, for my future kids and for other future kids who are going to struggle like I did? How do I solve that? in a way that I'm already equipped to do. And so having tech background, having tech training background, I felt like that was a really good entry point, but obviously not going to do anything in, in cloud or Linux that's already very well covered. So that wouldn't yeah. make any sense anyway. And I kept thinking back to what, what else am I experienced in? What else am I very passionate about? And I kept thinking back to my beginnings in cybersecurity and it's like, okay, well, why did I leave that in the first place? because it just kind of happened all at once. But reflecting back on that, that's when I realized that I had left because it didn't feel like a welcoming community and because I couldn't find the resources in both tutorials, but also in, in people mentorship to help me break through into that industry. And so I, I kept researching it a little bit more. I kept talking to friends who were in that industry about some of the pain points that were there. And I kept hearing the same thing over and over again. Some of those things being it's very hard to get your foot in the door in cybersecurity because yeah. all the companies are expecting five plus years of experience. But how do you get five plus years of experience if you don't have any? It, it, it makes no sense. It's a chicken and egg problem. <clears throat> and yeah. it's extremely pronounced. It, it happens in cloud for sure, but it's even more so pronounced in cybersecurity. So when you combine that challenge with the fact that some people feel like it's more of a closed off industry and not as welcoming of an industry, you have a recipe for a massive skills shortage. Uh, and then when you look at how organizations hire for those positions, mm -hmm. and a lot of them are frankly doing it wrong, you combine both ends of that problem. And again, you have a ma massive skill shortage. And so when I when I looked at that, those problems, when I looked at my experience and my passions and interests, it made perfect sense to, to start cyber, focusing on cybersecurity with building a friendly and welcoming community and also offering some training in areas where there are a, a massive need of skills. That's amazing. That's amazing. Cause, uh, yeah, it, it, uh, I guess you, you did go back to, you know, the beginnings where you asked those questions and, um, you know, it, it gets to, you, I guess you did it earlier on in life, but everyone goes through that question of, okay, what do I do next? Mm -hmm. How do I, uh, make myself happy? And, actually contribute something to society. Um, and, and, you know, fortunately for you, you did it earlier on in your life. Um, I only uh, discovered that at 45. <laughs> so, so yeah, I can, I can totally understand where you're coming from. Um, you know, being a, a course author, course creator, um, you know, I was looking at the education system too. And, you know, it's, it's flawed for a lot of people. I mean, you know, don't get me wrong, computer science uh, courses do have their place. Mm -hmm. But when you learn the basics, that's fantastic. But you can't get it. You can't get a job with just the basics. You need to know some other stuff on top of that. And uh, and it's something that is not 
uh, commonly taught in in a lot of these classes. The other problem, Anthony, is that, and I don't remember the exact dates. I have a terrible memory, but I do remember that the the education system as we know it in the United States and and in most places around the world was mm -hmm. designed for a completely different era. It was designed for when we needed factory workers, and yeah. so they they designed the system around how do we build factory workers? How do we build people that can go through these training programs and then end up at a, a car factory or plane factory and pump out some products. And it never really truly, it, it evolved on that faulty platform. And, and at the time it wasn't faulty, but now for the skill set that we need, which is yeah. less of the, the manual factory worker, more okay. so of, of the thinking and, and management and things like that. So as we evolve towards needing more of that skill set, I think we have to completely rethink the foundation from which education is built on. And, and that takes time. That's a very yeah. complex thing to try to do. And not a single person or a single company can solve that on their own. But if I leave a legacy behind, if, I, if there's one thing I do when I before I die, it's that I want to try and, and make that that education system better. And so, it, you know, again, thinking back through and, and it, people figure that out at different stages. It took me a while as well, or at least it felt like it took an eternity, but I really just kept going back to the idea of how do I make education better and, and how do I help people figure out their career paths faster? Yeah. And, and I mean, you're doing that with, uh, with cyber for those of you who are interested, um, cyber.com, uh, go and check it out. Uh, you know, Christoph, I, I went through your um, uh, cross cross side scripting course, and that was just chock full of information. I was just like, "Wow!" Um, tell us more about cyber, and you know what your plans are with it, and you know where you're planning on going with it in the future. First of all, thank you for taking that course. I appreciate it. I know you're really busy building your own training, so I, I appreciate you taking the time to give me some valuable feedback in that. Anytime we can get feedback on training, it, it's always helpful in improving it. So thank you. But uh, definitely thank you for, for asking about cyber as well. And it, again, it kind of ties everything back together, I think, in a, in a pretty bow tie, which is that we're, we're looking at the cybersecurity industry because there's a lot of need there. There's some major pain points there. And those pain points are pain points that I felt going through the tr traditional training. So I think when we look at it holistically or from a, a high point of view, there are two main things that we're trying to solve with cyber. The first one is providing that welcoming, friendly community where people can go and they can ask questions and they can find mentors and they can figure out what it is that they want out of this career and really kind of like where you were saying, hopefully mm -hmm. figure that out sooner rather than later um, by getting access to people that are already doing it, seeing a day in the life and, and stuff like that. Yeah. And the second side of that is, is really trying to just to close their own skills gap and to offer extremely affordable training that they can go through that is geared specifically for what hiring managers are looking for. So we're looking constantly looking at where the biggest skills shortages are estimated to be based on surveys and, and all kinds of data that, that has been pulled together. And we're building training for those specific areas. So you're talking about application security, you're talking about cloud security, security mm -hmm. analysis, things like that. How do we look at what those current jobs are? How do we build career paths around those jobs? And how do we, how do we offer that in an affordable way? Uh, so th those are really the two main short-term goals that we have. And I'll throw in one more, a little bit longer term goal, which is something I touched on a second ago, that is organizations are really struggling to hire. So when people talk about the skills gap, people get very upset because they say, I have skills that you're looking to hire for, but you, your requirements are way too stringent, way too strict. There's no yeah. way I can get this position. It's on you. It's your fault that you're not hiring the right people. You're looking for the, the, the unicorn, which doesn't exist. So it, <laughs> longer <Is> term, long? <laughs> exactly. Longer term, I want to be able to partner with organizations and help them figure that out. I want them to be able to realize that they're looking for a unicorn. And instead we have, you know, 10, 20, 30 people that are more than qualified to do this job and they're going to excel in this position. Let's hook you guys up together and let's have you have that conversation and, and figure that figure that out together. So that, that's a little bit more of a, a longer term plan that we have with, with cyber. Wow. So it's not just, it's not just about training. It's the whole package, like, you know, helping people find jobs 
and uh, um, partnering with companies and, you know, really creating somewhat of an ecosystem, if you will. The thing that kind of drives me crazy, Anthony, is that mm -hmm. a, a lot of times when you look at trading platforms, what they tend to do is just say, okay, take this training, get the certificate of completion. Good job. Good luck finding your job. Come back some, some other time, right? Yeah. It's, and that's like, well, that's also what the education system is doing. And in fact, we were talking to, um, I was talking to somebody, I won't name them, but somebody at, at the school that I went to that was pretty high up in the ranking of, of that school. And they were just, they were like, we, we're not here to help you get jobs. We're here to teach you theory. And I'm like, then why am I paying you? I'm here to get a job. Why the heck am I paying you this much money if you're not actually going to help me get a job? Yeah. And so I think it's realigning that together uh, and, and working on both sides with the education system and with the organizations that are hiring people out of that education system yes. and, and connecting them in a much better and seamless way than we currently have. Um, so, yeah. I, I agree with you 100%. I mean, you know, like I was saying before, you know, learning the theory is great and learning the basics is and the foundations are necessary. But if you don't have the skill set to actually do the role that you're being hired for, then you're not going to get the job. So getting a certification is fantastic. It gets you through the door. And I tell people this all the time. It gets you into the job interview. But if you don't have the skill set to do that role, then you won't get the job. And this is what we as uh, course creators need to train people how to do. And, so it, uh, and, and I'm so, I'm so passionate about it because, you know, ha, uh, I've, I've gone through so many certifications and you get asked about these, uh, about the, um, the technical details. And if you can't answer those technical details, well, then why the heck did you take that certification in the first place? Certifications are great. I've seen thousands <laughs> of people have their lives completely transformed thanks to certifications, but yes. they, they weren't actually, if you think about it, they weren't transformed because of the piece of paper. They were transformed because those people went through the journey to getting certified. Yes, it's they all about the it. they, gr they were grinding through the process they weren't looking for exam dumps. They weren't memorizing answers. They were truly applying what they were supposed to be applying to get that piece of paper. And that's what uh, that's supposed to symbolize. So I always say it's not about the paper certification. It's about the journey to getting certified. Yes, agreed. 100% agree with you, Christoph. Uh, so listen, I'm going to take a moment to uh, answer a question that was posed in the comments from Mitch. Uh, and he's asking, how do you balance everything, Christoph? especially the areas where you're not adept at. So the, the business end, the development, the marketing, all that stuff. That, that's a really tough one and great question, Mitch. And I don't know that I have a simple answer for you. Obviously, if, if you're at a, like at Linux Academy, right, once we got to a certain scale, we were able to hire people. And so the, the trick there is just hire where you're weak, which is very hard to do, right? I say it as if, as if it's easy to do that, snap your finger is done. It's incredibly hard to do because you have to be self-aware and you have to be honest and you have to look at what you're good at and what you're really awful at. And then you have to find ways of finding people that are proficient in those areas that you're not proficient in. And some ways to do that is to pull in people on your team, even if they're cross functional in a completely different department that do have this that skill set bring them in and say, hey, would you mind spending 30 minutes with this candidate and, and help me find if they have the right skill set for me or not? And more than often, they're willing to do that. But if you're in a startup and you you don't have the, the capital to hire for your weaknesses, try to overcome it as best as you can. But maybe it's a sign that you shouldn't be focusing in those areas. What I mean by that is, I'm not the best at, like I can do some design stuff, right? I designed this t-shirt, it looks fine, but a designer could have done it a hundred times better. Same with the website. A designer could design my website 10 times better for sure, but it's, maybe it's okay for now. Maybe it's okay until we get enough capital to hire that designer, we'll just get by. And if you have enough of a, a really strong offering and you, you provide enough value, people will overlook the fact that it's not super polished. So just focus on what you're really, really good at. Keep nailing that in. And then once you get to the scale where you can hire people, hire for your weaknesses. Awesome. Awesome. Um, so Christoph, you touched on certifications and I know you were, um, you were doing training courses for AWS. So 
those certifications, I, I'm assuming that, you know, you've taken them and you've received those certifications. Um, how has that helped you in your journey? It helped a lot. It helped me keep my job. <laughs> <laughs> because yeah, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I taught, I think it was three or four different ABS certifications, the, the CSA, the, uh, not CSA, sorry, the, the CDA certified developer, the certified sysops, certified DevOps engineer. And so I had to get the certification in order to be able to train at the level of the certification expected. And so yeah. I, you know, it, it was a job requirement. I, I didn't really have a choice, but I enjoyed it because learning again, going through the journey of learning for that and then being able to turn around and teach it was incredibly valuable because even if you have a ton of experience, right? I had a lot of development experience by studying for the certification exam, you always find stuff that you didn't know. Yeah. Like, oh, I had no Absolutely. idea you could do that. This just saved me two hours of time. I could have been doing this the right way the whole time. <laughs> and so it, it was definitely very helpful in, in keeping my job and being able to, to offer the best training that I could. Uh, but beyond that, just because of just because I've, I've been self-employed since then, it, it hasn't really helped that much. It just helps me be able to talk about it to people who are curious or interested in certifications. So from that perspective, invaluable in terms of actually getting a job or something like that, I personally have not received value from it. Got it. Well, I, I mean, you've just been, you know, on the, um, on the entrepreneurship train all the way down to, you know, where you are currently. Right. So, um, yeah, Mitch is saying, uh, you're right. I don't have the capital to hire. So thinking of co-founder path to cover my weaknesses. That's, that's a great way to, and Mitch, I'd love to connect, by the way, I'd love to hear more about your startup, but that's, that's it. And finding co-founders is super hard. Trust me. I've, um, you know, I, I mentioned a, a college vibe startup that I didn't really talk about too much in this, but we, I think it was a good idea. Um, the, the problem is we just didn't have the right founding team for it. And so it fell apart. So you have to have the right co-founders, but yes, if, if you're lacking certain areas that you think are critical for your startup to succeed, you, you've got to find a co-founder for sure. Awesome. Yeah. I, I, uh, I managed to find a co-founder really easy, uh, cause you know, without her, uh, I wouldn't have been able to do this. So, and that was my wife. Uh, if, if I didn't have her support, and her go ahead in the beginning and even, you know, making critical decisions. I'm like, should I do this? She's like, are you kidding me? <laughs> so, um, so yeah, usually the, the best, uh, partners I find are the people that know you best. 100% could not agree more. Anthony, the thing is, I don't know so many times my, my wife, now, but she was my girlfriend during Scalary Code days and LS Academy yeah. days. I, I don't know why she agreed to a lot of stuff. I mean, looking back at it, I was some of the stuff I would do was just extremely risky, kind of sounded dumb. And you could tell sometimes my family was also questioning it, like, are you sure you should do that instead of an internship? But she was always like, okay, no, yeah, you, you've, you know, we talk about it. She'd be like, you've thought, you've thought it through. You, um, you're very passionate about this. I trust you. You're going to figure it out. And I, I, without that, I would have never succeeded. So I could not agree more, Anthony. That that's one hundred percent spot on. I feel you. I mean, going from from fashion to to tech for me, that was a huge jump. And you know, my wife was scared shitless. She she didn't know, you know, what was going to happen. She knew that eventually I would make it because I I was a determined guy. Um, there was no way I was letting down. <laughs> and uh, and so. You know, um, she supported me throughout the the whole way, but she knew she knew me well enough to know that okay, we're gonna get through this, no problem. And that's a big part of it. In in any thing you're you're talking about, right? Startups or anything like that is just having the grit and determination to make it happen. And and clearly, you had that with your transition from fashion to tech. You were just like, mm -hmm. no, I'm gonna figure this out one way or another. This is going to work. I, I think that's what you need in order to to be successful. And, not everybody has that. So it, it's a really good thing to have. Well, I mean, it also helped that, uh, that I was broke <laughs> and I knew how much money I could make in it. And so, you know, I, I, um, my whole goal was to never be broke again. That was my whole mission getting into tech. Um, and you know, whenever I felt that, um, I guess you could say bottleneck, uh, that was when I was like, okay, what am I doing wrong here? 
how can I fix this? What do I need to learn? You know, all the same stuff that, that had happened during my first transition. So, I mean, that's a good goal. Don't go broke again. I, I love that. <laughs> you <laughs> know, I, broke. <laughs> in, in the scalar code days, I lived with my parents. I, throughout school, I, I didn't go to a, a dorm or anything. I just lived with my parents. So it, it saved a ton of money. It sucked sometimes, but it is what it is. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so Christoph, what other, uh, learnings assisted you to be better at what it is that you do? That's a tough one because there are so many, uh, but it, I guess if, if I had to pick maybe one or two things, I, I was thinking about this pre-interview too, of just like, what, what advice could I give to somebody who's trying to, to get a job? And this is the advice I give all the time in discord, for example, Mm -hmm. which is that if you're if you're trying to get that job but you're you're not getting the interviews or you're not getting the job try to find ways to differentiate like don't don't necessarily just stick to the beaten path because it is the beaten path for a reason everybody's following it so try to find ways of setting yourself apart for me it was the podcast nobody was really nobody else was really doing that in that space especially and in at my age and so a lot of times when i would bring on guests and they would see how young i was they they were they were impressed, right? And they would talk to me after the fact and they would say, hey, do you, do you want a job? Like we're hiring for this position. I think you'd be a great fit for that. People in my class were not getting those kinds of opportunities. So you have to find ways to open those invisible doors that nobody else has been access to, especially if you don't have connections, which I had, I had no network. I had no connections really at the time. The, the next thing I would say is if you do already have that role, once you get the position, move mountains for that position, especially if you're just getting started. If somebody gives you an opportunity, no matter how big or small, do it. I was handed opportunities that, I mean, I sometimes really didn't want to do those and probably nobody else wanted to do those either, but I would knock it out of the park. I would give it my 100%. I would go all the way in to make sure it was delivered well and on time and reliably. And that's what helped me get opportunities that other people weren't able to get because I would always deliver and be reliable in delivering. And unfortunately, a lot of people are not, right? They'll say they'll do something and then they just kind of fall short. So don't be reliable and you will kick butt. I promise you. Yeah, I, I want to I wanna echo that and I want to add on to that. And I heard something the other day and that is your reputation will always outlast your role. That's great. Love that. And so it doesn't matter where you are in life. If you are um, in marketing and you decide to go into tech, or if you're into tech and you decide you wanted to get into business or vice versa, if you have a reputation, it doesn't matter what industry or what role that you have. Um, it, it will it will come with you. If you're known as a reliable person, if you're known as you know, the guy who gets shit done or, you know, the gal who gets shit done, then, you know, you'll be known for that. And that's, that's, I, I found that's a huge part to, uh, to being successful. And one good measure of whether I'm doing that or not is if I'm comfortable or not. As soon as I start to feel comfortable, something's wrong. I just know it in my gut. I, I start to get kind of physically sick because I'm like, why am I comfortable right now? This is not a place where I should be comfortable. How do I push the boundaries further again? How do I get in that spot to where almost every single day at Linux Academy was extremely uncomfortable for me because I was pushing the boundaries of what I, I was thought I was capable of doing. Uh, but it ended up paying massive dividends in the long term. And like you said, that mm -hmm. goes on throughout the rest of your career with you. Uh, but it's, you know, it, you have to find the work-life balance. Sure, absolutely. Uh, but I was like, you know what? Well, a lot of people in their 20s are having the YOLO attitude. You only live once and, and partying and partying it off. Yeah. I'm going to work as hard as I humanly can or possibly can, I mean, because I want to be able to party the rest of my life, 30s and onwards, and instead of just partying in the 20s and then having to work the rest of my life. And um, yeah. if you have that attitude and if you just keep grinding it through, I, I really, really do think it will pay massive dividends. That's awesome. Um, so with regards to um to you yourself christoph what does the uh what does the future hold for you 
or what do you foresee the future holding for you? I hope it's a very successful cyber. Uh, <laughs> I hope we're able to to grow cyber to what I think it can be and offer people. Uh, I have a lot of short-term, medium-term, and long-term goals for cyber. This is the one company that I have no intentions of having acquired, right? I keep saying, oh yeah, I've had two companies acquired that I've worked at. This is the one that I want to stick to for the long-term. It's your I baby. Want, it's my baby. I hopefully am still um, helping it tremendously 10 years from now. And we're, we're achieving some of the very ambitious goals that I've set forth for cyber. So that that's my, uh, my long-term. And then uh, hopefully also starting a family here in the next couple of years, give or take, and, and being able to, to have cyber in a spot to where I can spend time with the kids as well. And so trying to, to figure that out, I think is going to, to keep me very busy for, uh, for a good chunk of my life, but uh, <laughs> that's yeah, awesome. That's, I got planned. Yeah. that's awesome. Uh, so I'm going to open up the floor to anyone who has questions in the audience. Uh, if you do fantastic. Um, if not, uh, no big deal. We can, you know, you can, uh, you can reach out to Christoph yourself or you can reach out to me. Uh, Christoph, what is the best way for people to get a hold of you? Best way is probably through LinkedIn. So you can find me Christoph Limpalair, L I M P A L A I R on LinkedIn. I'm on there multiple times a day, probably too much. I'm also on Twitter. You can definitely find <laughs> you me there <laughs> at Christoph Limp. Yeah. I think you beat me there on LinkedIn. I need to catch up to you. <laughs> I keep looking at your posts. I'm like, man, he's so good at this. I need to, I need to get better. Uh, you can also find me on, on Twitter at Christoph Limp, L-I-M-P. And then if you just want to email me, Christoph at cyber.com, C-Y-B-R. And also we have a contact form on cyber.com if you want to contact through there. Awesome. That's awesome. Um, yeah, it doesn't look like there is any questions, uh, but I did want to uh, thank the audience for the questions that were already asked. Uh, Christoph, thank you so much for, for coming on and telling us your story and, um, and really, and I'm hoping that, you know, somebody out there who is listening, uh, you've inspired and, um, you know, ha has gotten a little piece of information that helped them to, to move forward and, and do some great things. I, Anthony, I, I hope the same because that's what helped me on my path, right? Listening to those podcast episodes and having people share their learnings, share their experiences that fueled my fire internally. And that's what got me going. So if, if somebody resonated with this podcast episode, if they want to connect, if they have ideas, just reach out. I don't bite. I'm a, a fairly friendly guy. <laughs> so I, I'd love to connect. I'd love to provide advice where I can and, and help you on, on your path to, uh, to whatever success means for you. So thanks for having me on, on here. Enjoyed being on this platform, sharing a message and I really appreciate it. You got a great show going on. So keep it up. Thank you. I appreciate that. So, uh, now that we come up to the end of our show, uh, I want to thank you again for those who have tuned in. Uh, I will see you next week. Uh, same bad time, same bad channel. Um, until then, uh, keep on growing and keep on learning.